And joining us now on the line from Salt Lake City, Utah, Chris Faulkner. He's the CEO of Breitling Oil and Gas Company. And Chris, we're glad you could spare some time for us. We really want you to take us through the, uh, the old Pipeline 101 here, because there's all sorts of stuff we don't know that we need to know. So let's start with this. Roughly speaking, how many pipelines operate beneath our feet in North America? Steve, roughly 2.3 million miles of pipeline in the United States and in Canada uh, that operate the current oil and gas uh, needs of, uh, of North America. So uh, quite a lot when you consider uh, the Keystone Pipeline, for example, is a 1,700-mile stretch. So 2.3 million uh, is quite a lot more than most people think. Okay, and again, two different kinds. The difference between a liquid pipeline and a natural gas pipeline. What's the difference? Well, they both transport oil or gas in very similar manners, uh, both using pressure to push the liquid or the gas from the field gathering units through the pipeline into the pumping stations to the refineries and then out to the destination. So pressure is very important when they come out of the field. And as the liquid or the gas uh, transports itself through the pipeline, the pressure begins to deplete almost in instantaneously. So what happens is, uh, along the way, they have compressor stations or booster pumps, which repressurize the pipelines to keep the liquid or keep the gas moving. Now, depending on whether it's liquid or natural gas, is the pipeline itself made out of the same material? You know, it really is. Uh, the vast majority uh, of pipelines since the last hundred years that we've been manufacturing and putting pipelines into the ground, we've used high strength welded steel. So they're made to last, very, very durable, and pretty anti-corrosive. And that obviously is the point uh, of making sure they remain safe in the ground for very long periods of time. And just picking up on the last thing you said, how do you decide whether you want to run a pipeline under the ground or through the air or over water? Or how do you decide that? Well, yeah, pipelines, as you said, they can go underground, they can go above ground, and they can also go deep in the, uh, beneath the water. And usually the determining factor is, is a couple of things. Number one, the environmental sensitivity of the area. And number two, uh, we run them underground. Normally, if they're getting near a population, a dense population or a city, uh, again, a, a sensitive habitat, uh, whether that's for human or for animal, they're usually buried. Uh, in certain areas in Alaska, through the North Slope, we use pipelines still above ground, uh, but you're also in very, very sparse populated areas where there's really nothing around. But most of the time you see them uh, buried underground or beneath the water. We certainly all don't want to look at 2.3 million or 2.4 million miles of pipeline above ground now, do we? Right. Now, we're all becoming, I guess, a little more expert on the whole pipeline issue because of Keystone and because up here in Canada of Northern Gateway and we're trying to figure out the factors that designers would take into account when you try to figure out the route that the pipeline is actually going to take. So what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. You know, a couple things. They're looking for, again, environmental sensitivity. They're looking for other factors that may be in the way. So railroad tracks, uh, buried uh, fiber optic transmission lines, buried um, electricity lines, for example. They're also looking at the population density that's currently in an area. And they're also taking into consideration the growth factor of those areas. How many folks might be living here in 10, 20, 50 years from now? And they want to take all those factors into consideration. And then they're going to look at the path of the actual pipeline. So let's assume the pipeline's buried or we're going to have to cut through a mountainous area or we're going through an area that's pretty flat. And then all those things are put into uh, a construction uh, diagram and blueprint. And then an environmental safety study is done to see what the impact of that pipeline is going to be on the population near it and its surrounding environment. All of those things are then taken into consideration by the engineers in the pre-planning process, which can take three to ten plus years before a pipeline construction project ever begins. Okay, I hear you, but I don't have to tell you, Chris, that your opponents in the environmental movement say that you guys don't care at all about the environment when it comes to where to put a pipeline. You're here tonight to tell us that's just not the case? It isn't the case. Uh, one, the amount of energy required in this country cannot be moved through rail car. It can't be moved through the air. Uh, it can't be moved through any other mode of transportation. The vast amount of energy that both Canada and the United States needs and currently uses and is expected to use and grow over the next 10, 15, 20 years and beyond 
the pipeline is the safest and most economical method to move that energy to the end user so that it can be consumed. And we've spent 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years studying the environment around where these pipelines are at, making sure they're safe and to take into consideration the Keystone Pipeline, uh, we were going back and re-engineering a portion of that pipeline passing through Nebraska to ensure that it went around an environmentally sensitive area. So all those things are taken into consideration. The pipeline isn't just laid down uh, anywhere we want it because we have easements and right-of-way issues to discuss as well. And one important factor that we have in the United States a lot of folks don't know is when a pipeline passes over your property, the person that owns that property is paid a royalty or right of use, just like they would in an oil and gas mineral rights uh, kind of deal. So you have access to your property. We have to pay to lease that property uh, or the ground beneath that property for long periods of time. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of people involved in these projects. Just imagine 1,700 miles, how many thousands of people have to be dealt with in order to get the right-of-ways, in order to ensure the environment is safe, and in order to get the pipeline from point A to point B to move that energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, get back to basics again one more time here and talk about this. You mentioned earlier that in order to move, whether it's natural gas or liquid, through a pipeline, you use pressure to put it through. Uh, yes, tell sir. us a little bit more about that. What kind of pressure? How do you apply it? How do you make it go so far? I mean, the amount of pressure used must just be enormous. How does that work? Well, for example, in natural gas, when it comes out of the ground, obviously it's coming out of the formation, out of the well bore, and it's coming up to the surface at very high pressure normally. And so when it leaves that reservoir and leaves the well bore, and it heads into a, pipe, a connector pipeline, and then it heads into what we call a trunking line. The trunking line is basically a regional pipeline that's moving the gas, let's say, between cities. Okay, it can only go so many hundreds of feet or thousands of feet, depending on the pressure, before we head has to pass through a compression station. And that compression station, what it does is repressurizes uh, the the gas and readjusts its temperature and then sends it on its way. And so what that does is kind of re imagine the virgin pressure when it enters the pipeline. It begins to pleating slowly and it slows down. And it does that because of the friction of the gas against the pipeline. Believe it or not, gas has friction and it reduces its speed with the pipeline. So as it travels through there, it gets slower and slower and slower and it would stop eventually unless the compression station repressurizes it. That's a very similar manner we were talking about oil. Oil comes out of the well bore from the formation at a decently high pressure, either through virgin pressure in the formation or through a pump jack. Those things you see on the surface going up and down like a rocking horse. They're pulling the oil to the surface and sending that to what's called a field gathering system or FGS. Once it's in the gathering system, it then enters a pipeline headed toward a refinery through a trunk line, and a similar type thing occurs with what's called a booster pump that we have set in line inside the pipeline, and that booster pump just repressurizes it up and then sends it on its way at high speed, kind of like you would see with a roller coaster as it goes through uh, the main station there, the tracks pick up speed, it kind of shoots it out of there. Those happen on periodic levels of every 500 to 1,000 feet or beyond, uh, according to the pressure of the oil or gas as it enters the pipeline originally. Okay, and then th this may be a real dumb question, but as I said, we're really getting back to basics here. Does the oil or the gas only flow in one direction in a pipeline? Uh, it, it can flow in multiple directions. Normally, the way uh, coming from the field gathering systems uh, into the gathering lines, into the trunk lines, they're headed in one particular direction, usually out of the field, and the end result is going to be a refinery. And so usually it is one way, but they could be bidirectional because the pipelines have valves. You could shut them down, do different things with the pipelines if needed. Gotcha. Okay, let's uh, do some comparing and contrasting here. Uh, obviously, there's numerous ways in order to move energy around, and I want you to help us understand, in terms of a safety record, how pipeline transportation compares with other means of transportation, be it air, rail, sea, whatever. Pipelines, over the last 30 years, have an excellent safety record. Uh, they have uh, increased 
the safety of pipelines and the frequency that we have a spill or a breach uh, is what it's called, or a rupture. You might be familiar with that term. And those are happening less and less because, again, we're using high-strength welded steel. Now, the accidents we have seen have occurred from welding issues, from cracks in a weld, human error, but more importantly, the biggest cause of these spills that do tarnish the safety records of pipelines are through usually excavation work or digging. So a human or someone is out there, the pipeline is not marked properly or the markings are ignored, they dig into the ground and they rupture a gas or an oil pipeline. Now let's think about also one other thing you mentioned, rail car, uh, air, sea. All the pollutants needed uh, when you're talking about rail car and train, all the transportation, extra transportation on the roads to truck that oil or that compressed natural gas once it leaves the rail car going to its destination. All of those trucks, all of those additional trains would be needed if we were going to remove the pipelines from the mix and put it all through a traditional transportation model. And to give you an idea, Keystone Pipeline from Canada down to Texas transports roughly 800,000 barrels of oil per day. What would be needed are 400 rail cars, a 400 rail car length train coming from Canada to Texas every single day, one way to move that oil. Now imagine all the extra environmental pollution, all the transportation and all the, uh, the, the, the unsafe uh, record that could come from a train derailment or any kind of issue as that train's coming from Canada down to the United States all the way through all of our states here down to Texas. So there's no doubt that pipelines are the safest way to deliver energy to end users in North America. I appreciate that but you also told us off the top that you've got more than two million miles of pipeline in North America and I mean yes. it sounds like an impossible task to make sure that every square mile of that piping is in good shape to prevent potential breaches, ruptures, etc. How do you make sure that it is? Well, there's a couple things. One, we've got uh, a lot of technology goes into this. Um, we've come a long way in the last 100 years with our monitoring of our ruptures, our leakage systems. So there are actually devices um, called uh, smart pigs, if you will, and these pigs uh, are devices that travel inside of the pipelines and they're taking measurements along the way or with the fluid or with the gas and they're looking for things such as drop in pressure, change in temperature and those will give you a good indication that since the pipeline is a static uh, device carrying liquid or gas from point A to point B with no external influence, if you have a change in temperature or a change in your pressure, that's a pretty good sign of a rupture or a breach and then alarms go off and there are devices in those valves and the compression stations and booster pumps that can cap off the pipelines or seal them off temporarily until the pipeline can be inspected. Additionally, above ground pipeline, we still use helicopter, we still use plane, we still use car and good old fashioned foot to walk and verify those pipelines to ensure that they're inspected properly and they remain safe. And there's a lot of emerging technology coming out that even uses fiber optics and other methods that travel inside of the pipelines to verify that there is no corrosion, there is no welding issues or any kind of breach that's starting to happen. Trying to get in front and be proactive before you have a rupture and you have a major spill or a major environmental impact. Now I hear you again, but uh, you know we don't live in a perfect world, and every now and then something will happen. And we, ha you know, a year and a half ago there was a big natural gas uh, explosion in Texas. Uh, when that kind of thing happens, what do you do? What's the procedure? Well, uh, the first is uh, as soon as any kind of uh, external. Uh, influence uh, is detected. So the pipeline changes its characteristics. In that case of the rupture and that resulted in an explosion, the temperature changed immediately and so did the pressure in the pipeline. That pipeline then uh, was sealed off, the valves were closed, and uh, additional uh, hydrocarbon gas or oil gas in this uh, particular instance uh, was prevented from entering into the pipeline. So it went to kind of a, a holding pattern. The problem with that pipeline was that in, in the United States, we have an inner, uh, a, uh, a number called 811, and that's called call before you dig, Steve. And what that means is anywhere in the United States, if you're going to dig in the ground, that's whether you're out in your yard, 
uh, digging uh, for a sprinkler system or a new swimming pool, or you're out putting in uh, a, a sewage or drainage system in the middle of nowhere, you call 811, and then anyone who has pipeline in that area will come out and they will mark the ground. And what that does is tell you where the pipelines are, where the telecommunication lines are, the water lines, et cetera, et cetera, power lines even if they're buried. And that tells you don't be digging here because there are some devices or some tools or some pipelines in this case that are dangerous underground and you want to avoid those. The problem in Cleveland, Texas was the person out there did not call 811. They were digging in an area and the pipelines were marked, but they were digging in an area uh, further on where they initially said they weren't supposed to be digging and they were not marked in that area and they struck the line, they ruptured it and it caused an explosion. I see. Chris, in our last 30 seconds here, any new technologies on the horizon that you think might reduce the number of you know, explosions, breaches, ruptures, uh, leaks, uh, all of the things we've been talking about. There is, Steve. There's one that I really think is going to add to the visibility that we already have in the inside end of the pipeline, and they're called smart balls. And these balls are basically fiber optics that use sensors all the way through these pipelines, and they're taking readings as they travel submerged in the oil or being transported in the middle of the gas down the pipeline. And they're taking readings along the way using uh, fiber optics. And those measurements are sent back in real time to a uh, monitoring station uh, back into basically like a data center or a computer lab back at the pipeline owner's headquarters. And those readings are taken and they can detect if there's a, a minuscule crack in a weld. They can detect if there is something in the pipeline characteristics that has changed since the last time they've made the trip through that pipeline and all those things are then these calculations are made in real time and they are sent back to be analyzed and they set off alarms and triggers that can turn the pipeline off and shut everything down in an effort to proactively get in front of anything before a rupture or a breach or a spill occurs that technology just came out it's being tested now in parts of the US and I hope to see that technology smart balls mainstream in the next 12 to 18 months Chris, I never thought pipelines could be so interesting, but you made them so. Thanks so much for joining us on the line from Salt Lake City. Thank you, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.